Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, our weekly podcast covering the top three things on our mind as we start into the week of April 2nd, 2018. This week and for the foreseeable future, we will be doing the weekly top three as a segment on The Michael Duke Show. The Michael Duke Show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. Instead of doing this as a monologue, I will be joining Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about the three issues. We will continue to post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us on, of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these, the budget and the PFD, oil tax credits and bonds, it's more complicated than you think, and why we should take Alaska LNG seriously. At the end of the show, we also talk a bit about this year's upcoming elections. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. All right, Brad Keithley. Uh, from Alaska's for Sustainable Budget joins us. Uh, Brad, good morning. How are you, my friend? Michael, I'm doing great. How are you today? I'm doing good. Thanks for coming in and joining us. I was just starting to talk about the budget. And, um, and, I, and go ahead. And I was just listening to you, and I thought that was the right segue. I that was, that was my, my cue. That was your cue. That was your perfect cue. I was just going to make a comment before you came on, because what I found interesting, and I know that I haven't had a chance to get down into the budget and the actual some of the details, and I know you've been picking it apart. But I what I found interesting was that Nat Herz, uh, he came in and made a comment about this, and that is not reflected. Uh, it's It actually has – we've got a bit of a different um, – a comment from Steve Quinn, who writes for KTVA. Uh, in Nat Herz's article, it says that the House's budget proposal uh, would be $400 million than la- more than last year's proposal. Um, okay, I guess it's a, it's the wording. $400 million more than last year's proposal. Meanwhile, over at KTVA, uh, Steve Quinn writes that uh, it's also more than $1 billion above what Governor Walker proposed. So I guess the wording is is what's key there. One is more than last year. One is what more than the governor's proposed. But the bottom line is both of these budgets, uh, w- I mean, whichever way you slice it, this budget is bigger on both fronts. Well, it is. It, 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 it certainly is that. Uh, and as we'll discuss in the next segment, it hasn't finished growing yet, I don't think, because uh, one of the ways that the House – uh, tried to keep it down as they just didn't pay things that were that 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 we owe right the state owes so uh it's a it, it's 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 a uh, it's a mess right now let, let me try to for, for listeners let me try to reconcile those two things it is 400 million dollars more um than uh than last year uh there there is growth uh put in the budget uh, and the billion dollars uh, more than the governor proposes relates to something called receipt authority for for the Alaska LNG project. Something we'll talk about um, uh, later on uh, in this segment. But it's but what the governor had proposed in the in the in his budget was essentially that anything that the Alaska LNG project got from China as a contribution toward. Uh, the Alaska LNG project, and I think there's some anticipation uh, uh, within the next fiscal year, which begins on June 1st and runs to July 30th, um, uh, uh, 2019, that China will make some contributions. Uh, The governor's budget proposed that there would be unlimited authority for the Alaska LNG project to accept uh, those contributions. The legislature was uncomfortable with that and so amended the budget to put in a billion-dollar cap uh, on on the receipt authority uh, by Alaska LNG uh, of the Chinese, that that actually converted what was an amorphous non 
non non uh, defined number in the governor's budget to a hard number, a billion dollars. And once they did that, it added a billion dollars on top uh, of the governor's uh, proposal. So th- th- that reconciles the the two numbers. But but it is is the, this budget is bigger. Uh, the the house uh, the house, frankly. Uh, as the Senate, you know, has, has done in previous years, the House said, you know, we're sort of finished cutting, uh, and now we're going to start, you know, we're going to start adding back up. Uh, the 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 poster child for the adding back up is a five hundred thousand dollar study that the House approved uh, <laughs> to study vitamin D deficiency um, in the state of Alaska. At the same time, I mean, I mean the 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 the, uh, the the irony of this is just is just huge. I mean, at the same time as they're cutting PFDs, something that we're going to talk about in this segment, at the same time as they're cutting PFDs uh, by a substantial amount from roughly $2,700 down to $1,600, they're approving things like like a, a, a $500,000 study of, of vitamin D uh, in the state of Alaska. So, yeah, they, they've, they've started adding money back to the budget. Uh, all I can say is I've already done the study. Every Alaskan's deficient. Pay me. That's it right there. I can tell you that's pretty much it right there. Just pay me. Well, the, expl- the explanation of that study is that it's been a long-time pet project of Paul Seaton, uh, who – is now the co-chair of House Finance, and uh, and sort of like in the in the long tradition of House Finance uh, co-chairs, we can go back to Bill Stoltz, we can go back before Bill Stoltz, um, sort of you know drop things in that are that are sort of their pet projects. Um, one of my favorites is when is when Kevin Meyer was co-chair of of House Finance and then Senate Finance. We built astroturf football fields in uh, in for damn near every Anchorage high school. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that's what house finance co-chairs do. They drop in things that, that are, uh, are pet projects of them, but it's, but, the, but the, but the, the, the starkness of doing that, um, and the other ads that they made in the budget, not to mention the fact they didn't subtract from the budget, right, uh, right. but the other ads they made to the budget, the starkness of doing that. And at the same time, cutting PFDs, uh, by roughly a thousand dollars per person is just uh, is just huge. I mean, I there is no better poster child for for what has gone on in Alaska, probably time in memoriam, but but I've been concentrating on it since 2010. Um, there's no better poster child for what is going on in this state now uh, in terms of taking money out of the hands of Alaska citizens. Uh, through PFD cuts, a regressive, uh, a regressive tax on Alaska citizens, taking money out of the hands of, of, of Alaska citizens, putting it into the hands of government, and then letting a select few decide where that money goes. Uh, that's that's what we're coming to. I mean, people say that the PFD is a socialist program. No, cutting the PFD and putting money into the hands of government uh, and letting government make these decisions. Which contractors get, you know, which programs get funded, which contractors benefit? Uh, that's what that's that's the socialist thing. Uh, that's the socialist uh, uh, approach. Leaving money in the hands of citizens, uh, uh, which which the PFD would do, uh, is the capitalist program. And it, and not only is the capitalist program, it's the one that's got the biggest bang for the buck in terms of in terms of uh, uh, helping the Alaska economy. Yeah. This this stuff of of putting money in the hands of of government, letting them make the decision, uh, we're just <laughs> you, 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 we're we're headed for a we're headed for a a state that uh, where government is going to control even more than they have. Alaska has a lot of government control, but now we're going to be start putting taking money out of the hands of citizens, out of their out of the hands of their decision making, putting it into government, and it's just it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Let's talk a little bit about some of the details of the budget because you you started to delve down into it. Uh, like you said, I mean, it seems to be no appetite for restricting or cutting back on government. It seems to be they've made the decision they're going to cut it. They're going to tap into the permanent fund. It already factors based on a POMV formula. They're already assuming it's all going to go forward and move forward. That's how they brought the budget together. 
Um, but again, still some gaping holes in there. Uh, uh, some big ones. You know, seven hundred million dollars. Uh, I guess is what uh, is what one of the uh, pieces said that is missing between what they want to spend and the funding mechanism, which means they would have to go back to the CBR unless, I guess, they went straight to the earnings reserve because that only requires a majority vote, not a supermajority. Yeah, it's it, 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 we are far, far. I mean, we're only 20 days from the end of the 90-day session. That That's long since gone. I mean, we're not going to get this done in, 90, in 20 days. Uh, we're far, 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 far from the end of the of the budget battles uh yeah 700 million uh so they they did a five and and quarter percent draw on the uh pfd for, on the permanent fund uh to to make a withdrawal from the uh from the uh, uh the 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 permanent fund earnings reserve frankly that doesn't bother me much um as you and i have talked on previous programs we can talk here and we can talk on subsequent programs i'm not bothered by going to a pomv um, and as long as you stick at the at the POMB, as long as as long as you say that that's all we're going to draw uh, from the permanent fund earnings reserve and and constrain yourself, that is that is a, just a different way of doing what we've always done, uh, which is um, or at least a portion of what we've always done, which is using statutory net income POMB. It's just a different way of doing inflation proofing than, than what's in the current statute and probably a better way uh, of doing inflation proofing than, than what's in the current statute. But you have to constrain yourself then then to that draw. And and they made the draw uh, or they, they proposed to make the draw in the budget, uh, spending uh, 67 percent of it for government of that draw for government, 33 uh, percent of it for the PFD. That still doesn't. Uh, fund government. So you're right. I mean, now now they're stuck with, do we go to the CBR, which requires a two-thirds vote? The minority hasn't agreed to vote for that. Um, and so they can't go to the CBR. The House won't, the House hasn't voted to go to the CBR. That leaves a $700 million gap. Um, and some are talking about just taking it out of the earnings reserve. That would make the draw, instead of 5.25%, somewhere in the neighborhood of well, ten percent, over ten percent, because right. it's sixty billion dollar fund, uh, another seven hundred million. Yeah, we'd be over ten percent uh, in terms of the draw. So, we I, the the budget. You know, the House says we're finished with the budget. We've done what we've done with the budget, but it's a it's by far uh, an incomplete package. You mentioned something the other day, and I don't want to stray too far afield off here because we're you know we're talking about the budget, we're talking about the PFD. But you mentioned something a couple of weeks ago, which is one of the first times that I'd ever considered it from the perspective that you were laying out, and that was the discussion on the accounting method for um, the PFD earnings and the payouts, and how up until just a couple of years ago, they were never factored into the larger budget. It was simply a pass through. The money was not counted as income as it was paid out of the, you know, as, as the permanent fund itself earned money, it wasn't counted as state income and the PFDs going out to the people was not counted as an expense. It was simply a pass through. And now that's changed. And that has changed everything. I mean, it, it, oh, yeah. it has really tur turned it into this political football and I don't think I didn't understand that. I wasn't aware of that. I hadn't considered that component of it. And the more that I think about it, the more I realize what a piece of Machiavellian genius it is, because it gives all these politicians the talking point to say, well, if you want a balanced budget, we've got to do all these things, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's um, uh, it, it is 1984 ish, uh, George Orwell's 1984. And the point of 1984 for the three people who haven't read it in the world, because it was, at least in my school and growing up, it was mandatory. Um, uh, the point of 1984 is if you change the language, you change, you, you can you can control people by, by changing language. Right. And what they did, what they did two years ago is, is move the permanent fund receipts, uh, the permanent fund uh, uh, payouts for the dividend from what's called designated general funds. Um, over to uh, unrestricted uh, uh, general funds, UGF, from DGF over to UGF. And the difference in that is huge. Uh, the DGF generally is treated as, as, as a hands-off uh, flow-through item. Uh, we think about uh, tuition uh, at the University of Alaska system. Uh, tuition actually is state receipts. It's state revenue. 
but it's designated by statute to go to the university system. It uh, makes sense because it's, you know, it's, it's being generated by the university system in the sense of its payments by students for a university. But actually, it could be re- reallocated to, um, uh, to, to, you know, highway uh, construction. Right. Uh, there's nothing. There's there's nothing other than the statute that prevents that from happening. But it's often a separate column called DGF. People really don't pay that much attention to it, uh, and and it goes down. You know, it, it it's paid out for the things that the statutes uh, designate that it be paid for. The the historically up until the last two years, historically, um, uh, permanent fund dividends were treated in the same way. There's a statute that says. Uh, the permanent fund corporation shall shall pay out 50% of statutory net income uh, over to the, uh, uh, the the permanent fund division uh, permanent fund dividend division of the Department of Revenue shall pay out 50 per, corporation shall pay out 50% over to the division the division shall then distribute that 50% in accordance with statute it's all set up in statute it's all designated uh, in statute and and had been treated up until the last two years. As as a separate line item, uh, really that that stood on its own out there like like tuition, uh, and never got messed with. Two years ago, uh, legislative finance, uh, I am sure at the direction of, of various people and and OMB, uh, the governor's office of management and budget, which does the finance does the accounting from the from the uh, administration standpoint, suddenly reclassified. Uh, permanent fund receipts uh, for purposes of paying the dividend from DGF to UGF, and now instead of them being of them looking like university tuition, all of a sudden these receipts start looking like oil revenues, right? Like like you know like like oil and gas production tax payments, which are undesignated under the statute, go into the general fund and then are used to pay for uh, general fund items. And once you do that, then that sets up the ability for people to claim, oh, well, you know, it's government spending, it's government revenue, um, and the permanent fund dividend is government spending, just like, you know, spending on HSS or right. spending on uh, – It's government on, money. On, on any, so it's welfare. It's government money. And, so it's, it's welfare. Yeah. I think I know – I just, think I may know who asked in the legislature for this to be changed. Well, and you get, and then you get people like John Coghill, who I – Historically, I've thought very highly of, but but boy, I've, I've my view of John Coghill's just gone downhill uh, uh, faster than faster than a speeding bullet. I mean, then you get people like John Hill, Coghill saying, "Oh, it's it's uh, um, it's it's you know government revenue, uh, and to give it out to citizens is socialism and bad." Um, Coghill wrote a piece. I mean, well, I'm going to spend two seconds on that. Coghill <laughs> wrote a recent editorial. That's shown up in a couple of the newspapers that says, and this, I just broke out in laughter in the middle of it, said, yeah, maybe we ought to have a constitutional provision for draws from the permanent fund. Maybe we ought to POMV, have a POMV pro- put, provision put in the Constitution for a permanent fund. But the PFD, we need flexibility on, so we need to keep it in statute. And I'm going, uh, we got a statute now, and you guys are <laughs> ignoring it. <laughs> Oh, so God. tell me exactly, John, what the hell? I mean, I mean, John wrote this entire article and said, oh, we put it in statute. And, you know, we'll observe it and, and we'll pay it out according to statute. And then if we ever need to change it, we'll have the flexibility to be able to change it. If it's in the Constitution, we won't have the, be able to, the flexibility to be able to change it in the Constitution. I, you know, <laughs> these guys. Which sounds pretty attractive now. to me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> These senators that go on and on about statutes, we'll put it in statutes. I mean, the budget cap, we're going to put a budget cap right. um, in statute. Uh, you guys are just ignoring f- fiscal statutes right and left, and now you got a Supreme Court decision that says you can. So y- explain to me again how I'm supposed to have any confidence. Now you guys are just ignoring it, and the Senate has led the way on um, being the ones to ignore it. Explain to me why I'm supposed to have any confidence when you guys talk about statutes. Right. Let's you know, let, we'll, we'll, let's tally the scorecard for a second. 90-day session in statute, completely ignored. Paying out the PFD according to the formula, ignored. You know, spending up to the cap and over the cap, ignored. I mean, you know, we could go on. We could just go on. Yeah, it's a uh, it, – it's a uh, 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 I mean, I – so go back to if if readers or if listeners if if listeners have 
have any uh, have any spare time, go back and read 1984 again, and read it in the context of of what's going on in Alaska. And it's just it's fascinating. I mean, it's changed the language. You change the change the change the way people think about it and the way people talk about it. I mean, Nat Hertz talks about uh, Matt Buxton and others now talk about the PFD as government spending. <laughs> that's yeah, they... that's, that's not true. Uh, you look at the statute; it's not true. It's not government money. It's going to the citizens of Alaska. It's designated for that purpose. But you change the what you change the column you put it in, uh, and all of a sudden it's a different thing. And and now you know. And now we're going to have statutes. We're going to have a budget cap statute. We're going to have a PFD statute, according to according to John Coghill. I, I, they're just making crap up. Yeah. No. That's I, I, we exactly. can say, we can say, we can say crap since we're not on terrestrial radio now. Go, right? we, we can say shit too, so it's all good. Don't worry about that. But I mean, that's the th- that's the thing, Brad. I mean, they have they now have a a, contr- a grip on the narrative. I mean, I like Nat Hers. He does some good reporting, but I hate it when he doesn't reach deeper into the backstory on some of this stuff, and he just accepts whatever the press release says, and he doesn't move beyond that. I mean, again, to say that it is government spending when historically it's not government revenue, it's not government spending, uh, it's it's supposed to just continue to go in and to have that point be missed. That was a huge point for me. That was an eye-opener for me a couple weeks ago when we talked about that, and I the more I've been thinking about it ever since. That's how they framed this whole narrative. They've chosen the battleground by putting it all, and that's why we're seeing these things now, these ads, the new mantra of don't tax me so that we can pay a PFD. That's how they're getting that mantra into the into the uh, the ethos of of Alaskans' thoughts. Yeah, it's it's insidious. I, I, it, it is it is uh, it is George Orwell come to come to Alaska. It I and and you know you fight against that stuff and 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 you say wait wait this is not how we've done it, but it's how we're doing it now. And 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 the turnover in Alaska. I mean, this is this. I'm sure we need to move on, but one one last pet peeve. The turnover of, of the citizens in Alaska right. contributes to that, right? So, you know, I go out and I talk about Governor Governor Hammond, and people sort of give me a – sometimes sort of give me a blank stare. I, they they right. were here when Governor Hammond was here. Right. And so, you know, they he doesn't exist. He's not within their – within their frame of reference. And so, you know, you, you change the, change the column that you put the PFD uh, uh, revenues into the PFD payments into, and yeah, well, that, 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 that must be the way we've always done it. That must right. be, yeah, it's government spending now. It's just, it, it's insidious. I mean, we, we've got people who not only are not playing by the rules, they're not playing by statutes that they, that the legislatures passed and, you know, they tell everybody else to, 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 comply with and rely on not only they're not playing by the rules they're making up new language as they as they go along and, right. and making up new concepts and saying yeah well, well this is the way it is now right well and without that like you said without that institutional memory of people who've been here for years with a higher rotation rate which i think we're just going to see continue to accelerate i talked a little bit about it yesterday we're seeing for the first time ever a, a net outflow of people from alaska we haven't seen this kind of outflow since the s and loan scandal at crisis back in the 80s uh i mean we've got you know this 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 could be the canary in the coal mine more people starting to leave which leaves less of us to try and shoulder the burden et cetera, et cetera. that just accelerates it this could be problematic going into the future yeah, it it it's. I mean, we're we're, we're it, once you say that we're not going to comply with statutes, that's that's the thing that really bugs me. Once you say we're not going to comply with statutes, uh, once the legislature says they're not going to comply with statutes, what the hell are we doing? Yeah, I mean, we're 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 off in chaos. We're off in 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 a government that doesn't operate by the rule of law. Right. Uh, and 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 it's just I yeah. I don't know where we're headed, Michael, but it's, but it's, um, it's not any place that you can define uh, because you can't rely on the statutes anymore. Well, maybe Coghill was talking about some kind of double blind pinky swear statute that (laughs) they really, really mean it this time. Yeah. So since we passed it, we'll observe it for a year (laughs) or, or maybe, or maybe, maybe, maybe depends on what somebody says to me. So it depends on what my overlords whisper in my ear. At this point, I mean, I don't even know at this at this point. All right, so budgets are are not passed; they're passed out of the house, but they're a long way from being done. We still have no idea what's going to happen. 
Uh, people are frustrated. Uh, where does that leave us now that we've got this budget here? It's going to the House or going to the Senate. Senate's going to provide their own version of it. Then it's going to go to conference. Give us the rundown here before we move on. Well, I, let, let's use this as a transition to talk about oil tax credits because it's because that's a perfect example uh, of of what's going on. Uh, another perfect example of what's going on here. Um, so we've got all the you and I have talked on 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 the show forever. Uh, it seems about oil tax credits, and these are this is a legacy issue. We had a system from nineteen. Um, uh, 2006, excuse me, 2007, losing years here, 2007 uh, to last year, where uh, the statutes provided that if certain uh, uh, companies went out and drilled oil and gas wells, the state would essentially subsidize a portion of the cost by, by in, in many instances, just giving them cash uh, uh, to pay a portion uh, of their of their uh, 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 exploration and and development costs. Um, we've been struggling with how to pay those that we ran up those numbers that 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 program ran up to about four billion dollars right um, uh, five billion dollars uh, during its life uh, for a while we paid those uh, dollars as they were as, as they were incurred but under the statute we didn't have to do that the statute provided that provided a, a repayment mechanism in the statute that said the state shall pay uh, another one of the statutes that says the state shall pay. The state shall pay uh, a given amount each year, can pay more if it wants to, but shall pay a given amount, a certain amount each year. In the last few years, uh, since we hit the 2014 uh, oil crisis, revenue crisis, uh, resulting in a fiscal crisis in Alaska, uh, we've basically gone down to the statutory uh, provision and said we will pay what the, statutory, what the statute says we shall pay, uh, which is driven by our revenues. Um, uh, and and we're not going to pay more. We're not going to exercise the legislature and the governor are not going to exercise the discretion to pay more. We don't have the more to pay, particularly in a time when we're cutting the PFD, when we're cutting payments owed under the statutes to Alaska citizens. Right. Uh, it's that that seems a wise policy to to reduce payments to uh, companies down to the statutory um, obligation. They're still you just you know, keep in mind they're still getting preferential treatment. The oil companies are getting preferential treatment because they're getting paid their full statutory amount, while uh, citizens of Alaska are getting paid less than their full statutory amount uh, right. by the legislature ignoring ignoring the PFD statute. Now we come to this year, uh, and and the question on the oil tax program largely has been killed. Uh, oil credit program largely has been killed, so we don't need to worry about running up more numbers. But we've got about a billion dollars, about $800 million to a billion dollars in these things that are still sitting around uh, that producers have filed claims on. And the question is what to do about them. The House, in his, and, and the statutory minimum for this year, the statutory requirement for this year, roughly $200 million. Uh, I think it's 206 is the precise number that, that the Department of Revenue has come up with, but roughly $200 million. So one of the things in the House budget uh, is they only contribute $45, $46 billion, $4, uh, million dollars, um, to uh, the program. Uh, they, uh, the House says that uh, all we're going to pay is, is this amount. So the budget is going to go, is, it, that's going over to the Senate, is underfunded uh, for these oil gas tax credits by about $160 million. Um, the, you know, we talk about the budget already being bigger than it was last year. Right. It's $160 million underfunded uh, relative to the oil and gas uh, uh, credit program. The, the House's justification of that is they essentially have come up with a new interpretation of the statute that, that they say justifies uh, uh, setting a lower threshold under the statute. But it's an interpretation that the state has never, ever followed. Has has not been adopted uh, by uh, the administration, by the by the Department of Revenue or the Attorney General, that the legislature itself has never adopted. They've already they've always argued that the statutory minimum is the amount that has been given to them by the Department of Revenue using that interpretation. So now the House has come up with this new interpretation of the statute. They say justifies reducing the amount. Uh, owed by about 160 million dollars, short funded it uh, by that amount, by that amount, and have sent the budget over to uh, over to the Senate. I, 
<laughs> I, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, you just cannot make this stuff up. He, you can't. It's another Orwell, right? I mean, we've got another Orwell moment um, uh, uh, in the sense that uh, they're they're just you know looking at at the same language that we've looked at now what for eleven years uh, in this state. <coughs> Excuse me, eleven years in this state, uh, and now they're saying, oh, that's that that language. Oh, that doesn't mean what we always thought it meant. It means you know. $160 million less than we in this year right. uh, that we thought it did. So it's, I, they're just, Michael, they're just making it up as they go along. I, it's, it's hard to be rigorous. It's hard to follow this budget. It's just whatever's in the mind of anybody who happens to be able to, to control the process as it's going along. Depends on what your definition of is, is Brad. Don't you know that? That's, I mean, that's where, we're, that's where we're at right now. I mean, literally that's, that's what's going on. It, it blows my mind. That this is what they've got, uh, that this is what's happening out there. But here we are. Um, and, and this is what they're going to try and leave us with. Meanwhile, Alaska, again, depopulation, highest unemployment rate, longest running, biggest recession, uh, people leaving, people, you know, businesses closing. This is the reality that they seem to refuse to acknowledge. It is. It is, and 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 so they spend things like the five hundred thousand, the poster child, five hundred thousand dollars on the vitamin D study, uh, while uh, you know they're not funding the thing that ICER did. They're cutting the thing, the the program that ICER says will have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. The, this is the PFD, the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, which is by far the costliest uh, option that the legislature can pursue to Alaska families. It takes the most money out of the Alaska private sector. I mean, think about it. Cutting the PFD um, uh, uh, means that only Alaskans pay this new revenue source. Since the PFD only goes to Alaskans, it means only Alaskans are giving up money uh, to the new revenue source. If you did something else, like some people advocate a sales tax, I advocate a flat tax, uh, you would have, you would draw in revenues uh, uh, from from non-residents, if you needed five hundred million dollars in new revenues, for example, a portion of that uh, would come from, in the case of a flat tax, it would come from people who get income from the state, uh, uh, derive from the state, non-residents who get income from the state. <clears throat> in the case of a sales tax, people who, you know, buy things in the state uh, who are non-residents, you would get a portion of that five hundred million dollars uh, from non-residents, and so the portion paid by Alaskans. Would be you know less than that would be 450 million dollars of the of the 500 million dollars 10 percent less. But a PFD cut, if you're going to raise new revenues through a PFD cut, all that 500 million dollars uh, has to come from Alaskans. So so not only are they pursuing are they trying to balance this budget uh, by doing the thing that has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy is by far the costliest to Alaska families. They're doing it in a way that sucks the most money. Uh, out of the Alaska private sector uh, to put it into government. I, yeah, we've got we've got an economy that is that is on its back. You know, the, the best you can say about what's happening with our recession is it's not getting worse at the same rate it was before. Right. We're, yeah, we're sort of <laughs> wow. We're, we're sort of near, we're sort of reducing. We're shallowing out the losses, but there's still losses. We're losing people. We're losing uh, losing income. And and they're doing and the legislature is doing the very thing that has that makes it worse the the the, the, the option they can pick uh, that makes it worse and now and now they're you know now they're passing uh, budgets over to the other body that are short funded um, we already uh, people claim we already have a credibility problem with the with the uh, you know people who are investing uh, new money in Alaska oil producer companies that are coming in and investing new money in Alaska. People claim we already have a problem because we're, you know, observing the statute. Uh, I don't think that's that's a fair characterization of of that. But if we start reinterpreting the statute, if we go down the George or- Orwell hole and start, you know, start redefining what our statutes mean uh, because it's convenient to us, and uh, and now we're going to pay uh, substantially less, over 100 million dollars, le- or 150 million dollars less. Uh, than what the statute requires, because we're going to have a new interpretation of the statute. I, not only are we losing citizens, not only is our economy going down, we're going to lose the respect of anybody who, uh, you know, any 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 person who deals with the state of Alaska, because, you know, the, the question is going to be, you know, when, when's it my turn in the barrel? You know, right. they elect 
somebody somebody else when's when's it going to be you know my turn in the barrel to have to pay for this by reinterpretation of the statute well and again the dis <clears throat> excuse me the disingenuousness of this it, to me is astonishing and what i mean by that is well we've got to pay these guys we've got to pay these guys the statute says we have to pay these guys well yeah but the statute says you have to be done in 90 days the statute says you should pay out the full dividend <laughs> statute says all these other things and yet you guys are now continuing to ignore it and really i think you're right i think this is really the you know there's there's a thing called an Irish democracy where where basically when politicians pass laws and people just don't pay attention to it becomes an Irish democracy and because now the politicians have lost all their power this is almost the reverse of that where we pass laws and then they completely ignore it and so they can do whatever the hell they want then that means that we have almost no power over them except I guess at the ballot box that's the only place that we have the ability to do it I mean again the state's suffering. The average Joe out there is stuff for especially the bottom 60 percent of the of the economy, the bottom 60 percent of wage earners. They're the ones that are feeling it down to. I mean, the PFD cut, what'd you say, 28.3 percent affected uh, uh, are are have uh, the, the lower 20 percent have something like 28 percent of their income is what that dividend yep. makes up of. I mean, that's a huge yep. cut. I, 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 and it's not just the bottom 60 percent. I did an analysis. The other day, and I, and I suppose this is a good place to plug the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page, right? Because we put our analysis up there. But 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 I did an analysis the the other day of comparing PFD cuts to uh, a flat tax. I'm a, I'm a big advocate, as we've talked about before, of a flat tax, um, and comparing the effect of a PFD cut uh, for a family of four um, uh, earning the you know average uh, level of income for each of the income brackets. Um, I did an analysis of comparing uh, PFD cuts uh, of the level uh, that the House and the Senate have been talking about because they aren't that far apart, um, comparing that to a flat tax. The only ones who benefit from the PFD cut, the only ones who end up paying less under their PFD cut are the top 10 percent. The bottom, the remaining 90 percent of Alaskans pay more, uh, lose more income. Uh, as a result of the PFD, and, uh, as a result of the PFD cut, than they would uh, under a flat tax. It's, it, so, so this state, frankly, not only are we now, you know, just you know, in 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 in, in Orwellian land uh, because we're ignoring what the words and statutes means, being driven by the top ten percent. I mean, they're trying to avoid all this stuff about oh, you can't cut, you you know, paying a PFD at the same time as you have an income tax is bad. If the income tax were a flat tax, ninety percent of the Alaska citizens would be would be better off. Right. The only ones who would pay more, and it's only slightly more, like actually. like less than a full uh, percentage it, point or something, right? I mean, it's like yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, the average would be uh, the average would be for that top ten percent, they would pay something like two percent, two point eight five percent, two point six five percent, two point six five percent under a flat tax. Instead of losing two percent on average, two percent of their income uh, uh, due to the due to the PFD cut. So, to, in order for them, I mean, what's what's when you when you get down into it, what's really going on is that top ten percent, the donor class, the ones who who donate to the to the candidates, uh, either on the on the Republican side or frankly also on the Democrat side, and thus and thus have a huge influence over the decisions. That are being the positions being taken by the politicians. That donor class uh, of about 10% of Alaskans are driving a pol government policy, which is adversely affecting the remaining 90%. Uh, it, and and they're driving a policy that says, "I oh, just ignore the statutes um, uh, and 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 do what do what we want you to do uh, in order to achieve these objectives." It's it's it, it's staggering, and now it's, and now it's bleeding over. <clears throat> now it's bleeding over into oil tax credits by uh, by reinterpreting the statute there. Yeah. No, it's this is some I mean this is some spooky stuff which leads us I guess uh we have to get on to Alaska uh, LNG. I want to talk about that. That's your third of your top 3 things for the week. But I also want to talk a little bit about the election. So um you your choice where you want to go next. Oh, uh, let's do Alaska LNG and kill it off and then do the elections last. Okay. So Alaska Alaska LNG uh, a lot of people um sort of have this visceral reaction about it's going to cost us a lot of money. Uh, is it, is it, is it, is it a realistic project? Is it really worth the effort? Um, I've talked about uh, when I was doing the podcast, we've talked about on the program that I think Alaska LNG 
does have a realistic opportunity uh, and we shouldn't be killing it off. One of the things that's going on right now that frankly I think sort of counterintuitively makes Alaska LNG stronger and you're beginning to see that uh, in some of the press articles that are showing up is the Trump tariff war that, 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 <laughs> that we're in the process of launching against China. What, what, what is really driving President Trump is a concern about the, uh, in payment, uh, the imbalance and the balance of payments between China and the U.S. China uh, uh, sends over to the U.S. about uh, $300 billion plus more, almost $400 billion more in goods and services. We pay China about $400 billion more than China buys uh, from the U.S. That's really, when you get down to it, when you look through all of the rhetoric that's going on, that's really what's driving uh, the president's uh, 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 tariff war that he's talking about having with China, trying to restore, uh, deal with this balance, uh, this imbalance in the balance of payments. One of the best things you could do uh, to, to restore that balance of payments, to offset that balance of payments, is send energy uh, over to uh, over to China. China is a net importer, uh, both of oil and of uh, natural gas uh, in the form of LNG. China has a growing uh, LNG market uh, as they try to deal with pollution issues over there that, that's uh, generated from their heavy reliance on coal. Uh, one of the biggest offsets uh, that you could have out of the United States is to send is to export oil and to export uh, LNG over to China. China is already it's, uh, the U.S. has turned into a net exporter of oil. China is already the second largest market right. uh, for exported uh, U.S. oil. Uh, it's a huge potential opportunity for uh, LNG. So, frankly, I think you know if if if, the, if President Trump is serious about seeing through this trade war, and at least so far it appears he is, um, the, the 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 way that trade trade war is ultimately going to resolve itself is through China agreeing to increase uh, imports of U.S. goods. Alaska LNG is perfectly positioned uh, to be one of the components of of solving that trade war. So. I don't think I think I think it's way too soon uh, to, to 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 oppose LNG and to say that it ought to be cranked down. I think there's there's a window of opportunity that continues to be here. Uh, it's been there in the market. I think it's 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 there now from the political side. Uh, and something that I think we ought to keep uh, pursuing. Brad Keithley is our guest, who's with Alaska's for Sustainable Budget, um, and we're <clears throat> excuse me, we're talking about uh, his big top three this week. So we've hit on the budget. We've hit on the oil and gas tax credits, and now we've talked a little bit about AKLG. But the bottom line, Brad, is that there's got to be some solutions here. And uh, luckily, Brad, we're not in radio format. Uh, it's three minutes before the top of the hour, but I'm going to give you as much time as you want here to to, to sum up and, and talk about what we need to do moving forward. Because I, I think that's the key. The key is we just laid out all the things that are going on, all the things that are wrong, all the things that are broken, fundamentally broken in our government right now. And we need real solutions. And I think that's what people are dying for is real solutions right now. I need to know what your thoughts are in this. Where do we go? What do we do? How do we make it work? Well, we're going to keep going. I mean, it's, it's, it's all the players, right? I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the senators like John Coghill and, and, uh, and the representatives and the governor who are, are making up things as they go along, who are redefining uh, uh, permanent fund dividend revenues from designated general funds over to unrestricted general funds who are uh, now ignoring uh, a decade-long interpretation of the oil tax credit uh, statute in order to justify cutting things there. Um, that, that's, that's the players we got. I mean, that's, that's being driven by people. It's being driven by people who are deciding to ignore uh, the statutes, who, people who are, who are deciding to to, to, to reclassify uh, things. And, and the only way that's going to change, the only way that's going to change is to change the people, is to change, pe to change back to people who observe statutes, who follow the rule of law, who don't make things up as they're, as they're going along, uh, who, who, who agree that, yes, we are a nation of laws, and, and guess what? The legislature ought to observe them as, as well as, uh, as well as any the, the legislature and governor ought to observe them, uh, as well as, uh, as well as anybody else. Um, that and and the only way to the only way that's going to change, the only way that you're going to come back to, to, to sort of you know fundamental first principles, get out of the Orwellian box that we're in, uh, come back to fundamental first principles is to change the people, 
Uh, you got to change the governor. He's the one that uh, that uh, vetoed the PFD, arguing that you know the government needed to to save the money. Government needed the money more than people than the citizens did. You got to change the Senate, who frankly was a little bit ahead of the governor. Uh, they had a bill in to do that very thing before the governor did the veto. Uh, didn't override the veto, and then last year uh, did it themselves before the governor even had the chance by by uh, leading the charge on cutting the PFD. You got to change people who are in the Senate, and you got to change the House. Now, frankly, of the three of those, the governor's up for election this year. Um, there are candidates running against him who, who, who. <laughs> who, who are committed to following the rule of law. Right. Um, and so how unique isn't all that. <laughs> huh? How unique. What? <laughs> how unique. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. um, so you've got other candidates for governor. You got the house is a very um, uh, uh, slim majority. Uh, I'm not so sure that, that we wouldn't be in the same place. We had a Republican house, but at least, you know, we might want to give somebody else a try, see if they'll observe the rule of law. Um, the Senate is the real is the real problem. I mean, the Senate has been the leader uh, on on trying to move to POMV. The Senate has been the leader on on trying to cut the uh, the PFD. The Senate has been the one that's talked a really good game uh, about uh, cutting spending, but they haven't done it. I mean, they've gone along basically uh, with the House with some with some uh, uh, surface things here and there that uh, that they could claim was cutting the budget, but but really wasn't. And the Senate is the Senate is is probably the most difficult to move. Uh, you've got uh, people like uh, uh, Pete Kelly, uh, Senate uh, President, uh, Anna McKinnon, co-chair of Senate Finance, Peter Machecki, uh, Senate Majority Leader, Vice Chair of Senate Finance. Uh, you've got uh, 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 Kevin Myers' seat uh, up, uh, but you've got uh, Chris Birch, uh, a Republican who's Kevin Meyer like um, Chris has been a leading voice for cutting the PFD over in the House. Um, y- the Senate is is where uh, this is going to be very difficult. You know, Pete Kelly's out there in front on cutting the PFD, uh, ignoring the statute. Pete Kelly's up for re-election. He doesn't have a Republican opponent. Right. His only opponent now, so opponent right now, is Scott Kawasaki, uh, who himself voted to cut the, the PFD. Right. Who also favors uh, it, in right? the re- yeah. Yeah, in, in the re, in the revote the House did last week, so I there there are not. I mean, Peter mcchecky has got an opponent uh, down in his district, uh, uh, Ron Gillum, and 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 some potential there. Uh, uh, so far, Anna McKinnon hasn't announced what she's doing, and nobody else has announced for Anna McKinnon's seat. Uh, you got Chris Birch, who's the only candidate announced for Kevin Meyer's seat. There isn't even a Democrat announced in that district, so. We, the Senate is is not uh, – there's not a position right now where the Senate moves much. Maybe you get a new governor. Maybe you get a, a, a House that's, uh, that's more responsive to following statutes. Uh, but the Senate right now looks very difficult. And if you don't move all three, uh, then, you know, it, it's difficult to change – difficult to change the narrative. One can just, you know – Sit, sit on their hands and say we're not we're not doing anything different than what we've done it. We're going to continue to define the PFD as government revenue, uh, and we're going to continue to cut it. And and you know so the question is, what what do you do in a stalemate between even if you've got the governor and even if you've got the house, um, you got to change the people and uh, ha- and have a change to the people. You got to have different people running. Uh, we're seeing that in in the governor's race. We're seeing that to some degree in the house. Uh, we're not yet seeing it fully in the Senate. Uh, which uh, which makes you wonder uh, if we're going in a different direction at the end of the day. So <clears throat> we need we need candidates. We need good candidates. I know Machiki's got an opponent um, down in the uh, down in the uh, um, uh, in the peninsula area. Kenai. Yeah, in the Kenai. I know that um, uh, that Seton's got a couple different opponents. I don't know how how serious we are at this point uh, on some of these. But um, some of these, like Kelly, just doesn't have an opponent. And that, to me, is more of the troubling part of this whole thing, is that people are frustrated, people are not sure of the process, but we need good candidates to get it out there. Like you said, the majority in the House is very thin. We're talking about three people. Literally, it's a three-person majority. Now, if the Republicans get in, I know that there's enough Republicans in there who are very much smaller government Republicans that they could make a mess in the in a majority coalition uh, if that's what it takes. 
and make enough of a stink that they should be able to get some things done. But all we really need to do is change out 10 percent of the of the 40 uh, representatives that are up there uh, for reelection. If we could change out four or five or six of them, uh, especially the ones that are the worst offenders in what we're doing. We could make a difference on the House side. The Senate's going to be tougher, though. I mean, is there are there any whispers that you're hearing on, for example, Pete Kelly? I think Pete Kelly's got to go. So is there anybody that you're hearing any whispers about anybody thinking about it going up against Kelly? Michael, I'm not. Uh, I, I You're closer to Fairbanks than I am. Right. Um, and so you might have a better, better sense of it. But I'm not. I'm not hearing anybody uh, reaching out. Uh, uh, trying to you know raise funds or get support for a run against Kelly. Uh, Machecki's got an opponent. Uh, we need to seriously look into that opponent and uh, and see if uh, uh, see if he's electable. Support him if he is. Uh, Anna McKinnon. That's that that's going to be an interesting seat. Uh, Anna hasn't announced what she's doing. There's rumors that she's retiring. There's still this, the occasional rumor she's running for governor. I've uh, God only knows. Uh, you got Laura Reinbold. Uh, in that Senate district, uh, if Anna moves, and perhaps even if Anna doesn't move, you've got you've got a ch- primary challenge coming from uh, from Laura in that district. Um, uh, so there's there's other districts. Uh, Mia Costello. Uh, I still think there's going to be a primary opponent to Mia Costello. Um, there's two good candidates running for three good. There's two good candidates running uh, uh, in the House race against Jason Grin. We don't need two good candidates. One could move over to the Costello race, and, right. and I have some hopes that's going to occur. So um, I, I think there's there's places where we're going to get primary challenges, but I'm I'm it's not clear to me uh, that we've got enough challengers coming into this cycle uh, that's going to move the Senate significantly from where it's been. Well, uh, hopefully folks who are listening in Fairbanks right now can start talking amongst themselves. We need to get on this right away. I mean, the, the time is running out. We're talking about a very, very short period of time at this point uh, to get it done. The primary is in August. I mean, we are we are down to the wire here, folks. Five months of campaigning, filing, getting it all done. I think the filing deadline is the end of this month, in fact. So uh, now is it? Uh, June, June 1. June, June, June 1. June 1. Bit okay. So we got a little bit of time, but we've got to get it done. Uh, to make it happen. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. As always, my friend, great conversation. I really appreciate you coming in and, and sussing this out with us and talking with us about this. Thank you for being part of the program today. Michael, as always, thank you for having me. Well, that's a wrap on another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly 